Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending this Nano at Tech seminar. My name is Phoebe Welch, and I invited Dr. Lance Leon uh, from Penn State University to present today. Um, but so to begin, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Lance Leon, who's an assistant professor in the biomedical engineering and biology departments at Penn State University. Dr. Leon received his PhD in chemical engineering from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 2012. And during his PhD, Dr. Leon's cardiomyocyte differentiation from human pluripotent stem cells paper was awarded the best biomedical paper in PNAS and the Cozzarelli Prize of the National Academy of Sciences in 2012. Dr. Leon did his postdoctoral training at Harvard University and Karolinska Institute for Stem Cell Research. After joining Penn State in 2015, Dr. Leon developed the world's first pancreatic cell differentiation method for stem cells for treating diabetes with only small molecules, which makes this production much more cost effective and efficient. Uh, recently, Dr. Leon received the NIH Trailblazer Award, the NSF Career Award, and the Biomedical Engineering Society Rising Star Award. Um, without further ado, I give you Dr. Lance Leon. Okay, thank you a lot, um, baby. So um, thanks a lot for this opportunity. So um, today I'm going to talk about um, some of my work in the uh, human stem cell area, especially using these cells for treating cardiac diseases. So first of all, uh, I want to give you an introduction about my lab. So in my lab, uh, we have two key technologies. One is the stem cell technology. The other one is gene editing technology. So um, we coupled these two technologies to generate clinical applicable human cell types for therapy. And we test these cells in animal models. So that's why uh, we have uh, three areas listed here. So the goal for my lab is we want to use stem cells to understand human embryo development. And we want to develop cell-based therapies for treating diseases. So first of all, I want to introduce the type of cells that we are working on. Okay? So um, these cells are called induced prepotent stem cells. Okay? So um, how, how do we get these cells? So we can see from the left. So we can see uh, from a normal uh, human embryo development, so we have the so-called embryonic stem cells. And these cells have the potential to differentiate into all the somatic cells in our body, such as our neuron cells, such as our skin cells, such as our cardiac muscle cells. Okay? But the idea of, of human development is, um, can be reversed um, only uh, introduced by Dr. Siyang Yamanaka in 2006. So previously, we thought uh, development is a one-way process you cannot reverse the development, okay? But in the year of 2006, Dr. Siyang Yamanaka from Japan, he introduced a method that he can convert the fully differentiated cell, such as our skin cell, back into the embryonic stem cell-like cell. He, he called these cells induced prepotent stem cells, or iPSCs. So that is a fascinating idea. And in just six years later, he was awarded a Nobel Prize in medicine in 2012. Okay, so the idea here is uh, we can we can take a skin biopsy from any of the audience here, or um, some of your blood cells, or even your uh, cells from the your urine samples. So once we get these cells, we introduce four critical genes into the cells. So here. Um, these genes are called OCT4, KR4, SOX2, and CIMIC. Um, because this cocktail was first discovered by Dr. Siyang Yamanaka, so they are also called Yamanaka factors. Okay? So once you introduce these four genes into the skin cells, these skin cells will be converted back into stem cell state. So this is more like a turning back the clock in the cells. So imagine these cells are coming from a person who's 30 years old, and then you can convert these cells back into the embryo-like stem cell. So that's more like turning back the clock in the cells. 
So that's a pretty amazing technology. So once you got these iPS cells, um, they behave like embryonic stem cells. They have the potential to become all the cell types in our body, such as um, blood cells, cardiac cells, neuron cells, and pancreatic cells. So these cells are very useful for treating diseases. For example, cardiac, disease, cardiac cells are very useful for treating myocardial infarction, and pancreatic cells are very useful for treating type 1 diabetes. Okay. So I'm going to give you one of the example that um, we use the, this technology to generate iPS cells. So these cells are actually the, the cells that we isolated from human urine samples. Okay, so there are some somatic cells, residual cells from the urine samples. And the cells, once you culture in the petri dish, they can expand a lot. So we can generate these um, human urine samples. And then we introduced uh, four Yamanaka gene into the urine sample cells. Okay, and you can see two to three weeks later, uh, cells completely change their morphology. So they look like this before. But now they look like this, okay? So they form uh, nice cell colonies, and within each colony, we have thousands of cells, okay? So cells become very tiny, and they compact together. So these are the human iPS cells. So you can see uh, this technology indeed worked in our lab, and we can generate these human iPS cells. So next, the question is, once we generated these human iPS cells, how do we further differentiate these cells into cardiac cells for treating cardiac diseases? Okay. So the um, the reason why we are interested in cardiac diseases is because um, cardiovascular disease is a leading cause of death, uh, not only in the U.S. but all around the world. So we can take a look at. Um, a typical example of the heart failure process. So uh, let's say there is a healthy person uh, with healthy heart and uh, uh, coronary arteries. Okay, so everything is fine. Um, but uh, it could be due to some genetic risk factors or due to the unhealthy diet. So this person uh, may have a plaque formation um, within the blood vessels. So once this become more severe, which will block the blood vessels. So once you have um, the patient have a blocked uh, heart muscle, uh, heart blood vessels, um, the heart muscle cells here, because they will not receive enough nutrients and oxygen. So these cells will die. Because of this, um, there will be um, some remodeling uh, within the heart, and eventually this may develop into a heart failure. Okay, so this is a very very severe problem. So our idea is, um, since these muscle cells within the heart are dead because of the blockage of the blood vessels here, so how about we <clears throat> replace this damaged region with uh, healthy blood vessel cells, and also um, healthy cardiac muscle cells. So one way we can do this is um, we can use the um, stem cell technology. Okay? So in order to generate, um, generate the human cardiac muscle cells, so we have the iPS cells. So the idea is, uh, they are mimicking embryonic stem cells. So then what we needed to do here is you have these cells, and how do you give the cells the correct signal to guide them to become hard muscle cells? Okay. So what our strategy is, we try to learn uh, from the human embryo development. So the question is, how, how does a mouse make their heart? in vivo, okay, in the, in the animals. And uh, so we, we learned uh, this animal development 
uh, from different uh, um, species. So here, first you can see a typical example of the embryo development here. So what you can see here is at different time points, um, these embryos change their morphology a lot. So uh, what we learn here is development is a dynamic process. So at different time points, you need to give them different signals to guide them further uh, development. And uh, uh, because of this, temporal regulation is very important, okay? So you can see within here, um, at this stage, you already have a fetal heart here. So th this is the part that we want to guide the uh, iPS cells to become. And then if you see the mouse, um, it's pretty much similar, but seems more complicated. And you can see here at different time points, um, the embryos will develop, okay? So um, if you look into this, it's extremely complicated. There are many, many factors uh, involved in this process. And uh, if you try to mimic 100% of this in vivo embryo development, um, you will need to test a lot of factors at different concentration, at different time points. So if you do a simple mass of these combinations, that will yield more than a billion combinations. So in reality, that's not possible for you to test in a lab. And no lab can test one binary combination. Okay. So <clears throat> my logic would be um, can we identify a single developmental pathway uh, which could control stem cell differentiate into cardiomyocytes, so cardiac muscle cells. Okay. So when I first um, do this project and I talk with um, different uh, PIs, different uh, PhD students, no one knows how to do this project because it's completely new and no one has ever differentiated stem cells into cardiac muscle cells. So it's been extremely difficult. And when I check these cell signaling pathways, um, I know all of them are important, you know, in certain ways to guide the embryo to become the heart region. But my logic is, since I could not systematically testing all of them, how about I choose one of them and test um, its regulation, see if that could guide stem cells to become other muscle cells. So I decided to choose this uh, wind cell signaling pathway. Okay. So the reason I'm interested in this is because so you can see uh, this wind pathway, um, the blue region here uh, marks the activity of this cell signaling pathway. If you see a strong blue signal, that means in this region, in the embryos, wind pathway is on, okay, is active. And if you see here, um, it's less blue here, that means wind pathway is turning down, okay? So this tells me um, at early time points, uh, in the harder region, the wind pathway is on. At, at the later time points, the wind pathway is, is off. So, so that means between the early time points and the later time points, we have to shut down this pathway, okay? So the general idea is you need to turn it on and sometime later, you need to turn it off. So we are trying to mimic this and to see if it's going to work. So next, uh, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about uh, what is a wind pathway. <clears throat> so this is a cell, okay, this is a human cell. And on the cell membrane, um, you have some cell re receptors, okay? So this receptor is called a um, FRZ receptor. So this receptor have the capacity to bind into wind ligand. So this is a protein that can activate wind pathway, okay? So once a wind protein bind into its receptor, uh, which will uh, save one of the key protein here called a beta-actinin, okay? So this beta-actinin protein, once it's saved, 
it can enter the nucleus and turn on gene expression. Okay, so if we do not have the wind protein, um, this GSK3 beta kinase will degrade beta actinin. So in this way, there will be no beta actinin available for entering nucleus, and they cannot turn on gene expression. So in that case, it's called a winter off. Okay. So um, you can see here involved um, uh, four proteins. One is a winter ligand, one is a receptor, one is a GSK3 beta, and one is beta actinin. Beta actinin is the most important one because we rely on this protein to turn on the wind pathway. Once beta actinin enters the nucleus, it can turn on the pathway. Okay. So um, based on this cartoon. Um, we can develop several ways to turn it on or turn it off. So one way to turn it on is um, we can uh, directly use a chemical uh, to inhibit GSK3 beta. As long as you can block GSK3 beta, it will not be able to degrade the beta catena. So in this way, you can turn on wind pathway. So this is uh, this is the uh, um, here. If you inhibit GSK3 beta with chemicals, so you can do bio or CHIR99021. Okay. So later I call this chemical CH dot for CH. So in this way we can um, turn on wind pathway. Um, if you want to turn down, turn off wind pathway. One way you can do it is, you know, this pathway rely on wind ligand. You can directly block wind ligand uh, processing. So there is no wind ligand. So then you can turn it down. Okay. Or you can directly degrade the beta catena. So in biotechnology, um, there is a technique that you can design a very short RNA. And then these short RNA will bind into beta catena RNA and it will degrade the beta catena. So if you destroy beta actinin, there is no more beta actinin to turn it on. So therefore, it will turn off wind pathway. Okay. So there's another approach that we can do is we can uh, construct the beta actinin binding site in the genome, and then in this way we will know uh, whether this pathway is on or off. Okay. So I did it. So the first experiment I did is. I uh, inserted a, a genetic construct into the uh, stem cell genome. So if the wind pathway is turned on, cells will express GFP. Okay, cells will become green. So basically, when I culture these cells uh, normally, there is no green cell. So that means normal human stem cells, they do not turn on wind pathway. Okay. And then I use this chemical, CH. So this is the chemical here, CHIR99021. So I use this chemical to treat stem cells. Indeed, I can turn on the wind pathway and some of the cells become green okay, after I treat the cells with this uh, chemical to activate the wind pathway. And if I treat the cells with this chemical for three days, and you can see, I can generate more GFP cells. Okay, if you treat only for only one day, only five percent of the cells become green, and if you treat for three days, uh, forty percent of your cells become green. And the green cells, um, fortunately, um, the green cells are uh, indeed uh, differentiated and then become cardiac progenitor cells. So that's that's very, very good, uh, good news for me, because um, our hypothesis is if you activate the wind pathway, um, stem cells will further develop into the cardiac cells. And indeed, we see this phenomenon. And next, uh, we want to test um, our ideas in the um, previous um, theorem based differentiation. So we want to see if we coupled with winter activation, would that enhance our ability to
to generate more cardiac cell. Okay, so here uh, we treated the cells with this chemical to activate uh, wind pathway, and then we do the differentiation. So the y-axis is the percentage of the beating EBs. So EBs are the stem cell clusters. So if we have more beating cells, so the beating cells are cardiac muscle cells, and no other cells in our body will sp spontaneously beat. Okay. So you can see if we do not treat the cells with a chemical, um, we only have about 10% of the cells. Uh, they are uh, beating cells. If we treat the cells with two micromolar, you can see now we have about 25% of the cells become beating cells. So indeed, if you treat the cells with a chemical, uh, you can increase your ability to generate more cardiac cells. Okay. So then we use another protocol to test the idea. We use a CH or bio to treat the cells first before we do differentiation. You can see in the control, you have only about 5% of the cells are cardiac cell. So the CTNT is a protein only expressed in cardiac muscle cells. If you treat the cells with CH, you can see now you got around 50% of the cells become a cardiac muscle cell. So it greatly increased the efficiency. Okay. So what about uh, we um, lock down beta -actina. So you can see here, uh, we use a biotech strategy to um, degrade the beta gene. Okay. So if you destroy beta -actina, you will shut down wind pathway. So you can see, if you shut down the wind pathway at early time points, for example, day zero, you get almost nothing. Okay, so there is no cardiomyces that you can generate. So this tells us wind pathway at the very early stage of differentiation is very, very important. You should never shut down wind pathway at the early time points. But you can see at a little bit later time points, you can shut down the pathway and you can increase the efficiency. Okay, so the idea here is if you want to generate cardiac muscle cells at the early time points, you should turn on the pathway instead of shut down the pathway. Okay, and then at a little bit later time points, you should shut down the pathway. Okay, so turn it on and then later turn it down. You will be able to generate a cardiomyocyte. So to test this idea, and then without using the uh, other signals to um, guide the stem cell differentiation, we decided to test um, a completely new protocol. Um, so this protocol is um, how about at early time points, let's say day, day zero, we started to turn on wind pathway, and at a little bit later time points, we are going to shut down the pathway. But we didn't know exactly the time to shut down the pathway. Okay. So that's why we decided to test uh, um, different time points to shut down the pathway to see which time point gave us the best results. Okay. So the idea here is we have stem cells here and then we culture the stem cells for five days. And five days later, uh, we call it day zero. We started to treat the cells with a chemical called a CH to activate the wind pathway. And then we use this drug DOCS to shut down wind pathway at different time points. So we shut down the pathway on day zero, day one, day two, day three, day four. So we do try all these different time points. And then on day 30, uh, we are going to assay um, the percentage of cardiac muscle cells that we have. We use a marker protein called a cardiac troponin T, CTNT. So this protein only expressed in uh, cardiac cells. Okay. So first, what we find is if you shut down wind pathway at day zero, um, you have minimal cardiac muscle cells. So this is consistent with what we know before. You should never shut down wind pathway at early time points if you want to generate cardiac muscle cells. 
Okay. And then we test different time points. So surprisingly, we find the best time point actually is, is something here, day 1.5. So 36 hours later. Okay. So if you add the docs to shut down wind pathway uh, at day 1.5, you will generate more than 80% of the cells to become cardiac muscle cells. So the efficiency is extremely high you know, at that time point. Um, no one can generate this high efficiency, okay? Um, so this 36 hours is a very tricky time point. Um, it's probably also the reason why no one else has been able to discover this. So imagine that you do the experiment uh, 2 p.m. in the afternoon on day zero. So day 1.5 will be the next day 2 a.m. in the morning. And usually no one do experiment 2 a.m. in the morning. Um, the reason we discover this is because we test all the time points between day zero and day two, and we test every hour. So, um, you know, I by that time, I was a PhD student at the University of Wisconsin, and I have some undergraduate students work with me. So um, they are in chemical engineering. Um, they have a lot of um, homework to do. So they usually stay overnight there. So I just ask them to uh, help me at this drug every hour. You know, they needed to go to lab every hour and add a little bit of drug to shut down the wind pathway. So we are very fortunate today to discover this unique time point. So this is very, very difficult to discover. So then we use a more potent uh, um, SHRNA to shut down wind pathway, and we can even generate 98% of the cells become cardiac muscle cells. So it's almost all the cells become cardiac muscle cells. So this is also for the first time a uh, manipulation of one cell signaling pathway um, has yielded a strategy for the generation of relatively pure population of cardiomyocytes. Okay. So this is a image of the cells that we generate. So you can see almost all the cells here uh, express the cardiac troponin T. And these cells function like uh, normal human heart cells. So they show uh, ventricular action potentials. And the beating rate is like our human beings. Okay, So they beat about um, 60 to 70 times per minute. And let me show you one of the videos that we generate. So you can see uh, these cells, they connect with each other and they form these beating waves. This just like uh, ocean waves. So remember, these are human cardiac muscle cells. And if you didn't have this stem cell technology, um, it's almost impossible to get this amount of human cardiac muscle cells because no one is willing to donate their heart for research. So this is um, this is for the first time we generate a lot of um, human cardiac muscle cells. So we did a little bit further characterization of the cell. So on the top, this is one single cell. Okay, so you can see you only have one cell nucleus here. So this is just one single human cardiac muscle cell. You can see. Uh, we have very, very nice uh, sarcomere structures here. Okay? So, and then this is uh, like a model layer of cells. And then we did the uh, uh, scanning electron uh, micrography. So you can see, um, clearly see the, the structure within the uh, cardiac muscle cell. So first you see these uh, myofibers. Okay, so these are the myofibrous structure. And then you see the Z-band, okay, you see the Z-band. So these are the typical structures you can see in harder muscle cells. And then you see a lot of mitochondria. You see a lot of mitochondria, um, more than other cell types. Because cardi cardiac uh, muscle cells, uh, they beat all the times. They consume a lot of energy. So if you check uh, what's going on in this uh, in this lab um, stem cell differentiation as compared to the uh, in vivo, so what we are uh, 
thing here is although these iPS cell differentiation was done in the lab, but they mimic very well of what's happening during the embryo development. Okay, so the cells are starting from a stem cell stage, and then they go through the so-called mesenderm, uh, cardiac mesoderm, and early cardiomyocytes, and the later cardiomyocytes. Okay, so very, very interestingly, um, the in vitro lab experiments mimics what's happening in the embryo. And that's why we can use this stem cell model to study human embryo development. So, you know, for your information, um, it's extremely difficult to study human em uh, embryo development. So, especially for the first two months, one to two months, because the embryos are so tiny, and uh, there is a uh, we we have a little tools for uh, imaging of the early embryo development. Okay, you just cannot see it by that time point. But with the stem cell technology, you can use the cells and culture the cells uh, in the lab, and then you can study what's going on uh, in embryos. Okay, another important thing I want to mention is the iPS cell technology. Uh, these cells look exactly like. Uh, embryonic stem cell, but we never use any embryo materials. There is no embryo materials at all here. So, so then there is no ethical concern here, because what we do is we isolate uh, adult person's urine cells, cells from urine samples. There is no embryo at all. We never use any human embryos, okay? So there is no ethical concern here. And once we generate these um, cardiomyocytes, and we culture them for a long period of time, so very, very interestingly, these cells can uh, maintain their spontaneously beating activity for more than one year. So you can culture the cells, and they are always beating there. And even after one year, they still beat. Um, but I stopped my experiment after one year. Um, it's not because they died or so, the, you know they died or something. It's because um, I have to graduate from my PhD degree, and I I'm not going to feed them anymore. Okay, so that's why I you know I stopped the experiment. But they look very nice even after one year of culture in the lab. Okay, so if you culture the cells for a longer period of time, the cardiac muscle cells become more mature. Okay, it's just like uh, you know cells during the embryo development. So the fetal cardiomyocytes are immature. And then once the baby was born and then become an adult person, the muscle cells become more mature. The same thing here. If you culture the cells uh, in the lab for a longer period of time, cells will become more mature cardiac muscle cells, okay? So how do we know they become more mature cells? It's because um, the mature cells express of this mature cell protein called MLC2V. You can see the percentage of the cells express this MLC2V, these uh, gray areas are increasing during the time, okay? And then uh, the other feature is cells lose the most muscle actin, become more mature. You can see the percentage is also increasing during time. So then we know uh, cells become more mature, okay? And another feature of mature cells is mature cells will stop proliferation. And you can see um, BRDU and KI67 is the marker for um, proliferating cells. You can see uh, they are losing these proliferating markers. That means they become less proliferative, and that means they are more mature, okay? So then next, uh, we decided to uh, develop a technology that we can use um, a chemical to block wind pathway instead of use the um, small RNA to do it, okay? Because a small RNA requires genetic modification of the cells first, okay? So um, after screening with several chemicals, we find that there's a chemical called IWP, so this chemical uh, 
can be used to inhibit the winter pathway. You can see if you use this chemical, um, the uh, this is use the chemical approach. The efficiency that you generate, the percentage of cardiomyces you generate, is pretty much similar. Like you use the gene approach. Okay, so uh, inhibition of the wind production is as effective as beta actinic lockdown for generating cardiomyces. So if you think about it, now the protocol has simplified with just the two chemicals. The first chemical is called a CH which will activate the wind pathway. The second chemical is called IWP, which will inhibit the wind pathway. If you use these two chemicals, you can make good cardiomyces, okay? And the cardiac muscle cells uh, that we generated um, can also be used to generate uh, cardiac tissue. So let me show you one of the videos about the tissue that we generated. So this is a uh, cardiac tissue that we generated. So you can see um, there are a lot of uh, cells here. And uh, on both ends, uh, what we have here is, let me show you one more time. On both uh, ends, uh, this tissue is connected to a uh, force transmitter. So they can sense how much force um, this cardiac tissue can generate. So once we generated these tissue, once we generated the tissue, uh, we test uh, how much uh, force that they can generate. And then we treated the tissue uh, with a drug uh, called uh, dubutamine. So this drug actually is a drug used in clinic. Okay? So they use this drug to treat heart failure patients. So this uh, DOB drug can increase the force that the heart can generate. So indeed, in our uh, lab-grown heart tissue, you can see um, the red uh, is from the cardiac tissue with the drug. You can see clearly uh, it generates more forces, okay, compared to the tissue without the drug treatment. Okay, so what do we see here is uh, we can use stem cell-derived cardiac tissue. To make uh, to mimic what's really happening in clinic, okay. Okay, so in summary, um, this is the approach that we do. So um, we call it GWI protocol because we use a uh, GSK3 inhibitor and a wind inhibitor. Okay, so you can see you start with uh, human stem cells, and the goal is to generate cardiomyocytes. And all you needed to do is you need to buy two chemicals and then you need to treat the cells uh, with the first chemical at early time points and the second chemical a little bit at later time points. And then you can generate um, the efficient cardiomyces. Okay? More than 90% of the cells become cardiomyces. And the cells uh, can be used for um, cell therapy. Okay, so um, that is all for my talk today. So I would like to acknowledge uh, my funding um, from um, Penn State and also from NIH. Thank you all for attending this uh, lecture. Um, now it's time for me to take your questions. Hi, right, thank you so much for the presentation. Yeah, um, no for those uh, in the audience, if you have any questions, please put them into the Q and A uh, chat. Um, I'll start because I have a couple questions um, in regards to um, stem cell development in general. Uh, what's more important, getting a high purity or higher yield? Yeah, that's a great question. I think both of them are important. Um, because, uh, for example, for uh, the cardiac cell and the neuron or beta cell, once they generate, these cells will lose proliferation very rapidly. So in this case, you want to uh, you want to have both high purity and high yield. Uh, but for a cell type, let's say 
you want to generate um, some uh, liver cells, hepatocytes from stem cells. So in that case, um, uh, high uh, yield may not be that important. Be the reason is because once you generate um, pure of these liver cells, they can proliferate. So even you generate a small amount, but you can culture the cells and they can proliferate and they can generate a lot of these cells. But for neuron or cardiac cells, both of them are important. Mm. Okay. And then my second question is, um, I may have missed this in your talk, but do you grow your cells on a special substrate so that it enables them to beat the way that they were beating? Um, yes, so that's a good question. So we usually um, culture these cardiac muscle cells on the uh, fibrin and nectin coated uh, uh, culture dishes. So uh, cardiac cells uh, prefer fibrin nectin, but mm -hmm. uh, if you do uh, metrogel or um, collagen, um, they also work. Works. It's not as good as fibrin nectin. Mm -hmm. Okay, gotcha. Well, that's all my questions. I guess we can wait to see if anyone puts them into the Q&A. Sure. Otherwise, yeah, whatever question, just feel free to ask questions, yeah. Okay, yes, the question is, are there other pathways you considered before diving into Wnt signaling for cardiomyocyte development? That's a great question, that's a great question. Definitely, um, before my approach, um, you know, there are, um, you know, there are already some other people tried different pathways. So for example, there is a pathway called a BNP pathway. So the bone uh, morphogenesis um, protein pathway. So these pathways are also very, very critical for stem cell differentiation. And people tried that. And I also tried it. So um, the, at the very beginning, so I combined the wind pathway with the BNP pathway, see what happens. Indeed, the uh, wind pathway uh, modulation enhance the BMP pathway effect. And, but later, what I find is all I need is modulating the wind pathway. Even I do not modulate the BMP pathway, it still worked. So, you know, try to make it as simple as possible. So that's why my final uh, differentiation protocol is only involved in modulation of wind pathway with just two chemicals. Yeah, this COVID it ch completely changes everything. Okay, there's another question. Yes, is it feasible to 3D print tissues with these cells? Yes, that's possible. So um, as a matter of fact, um, we are collaborating with a uh, leather lab. Um, they are experts in 3D printing and they are using our uh, human cardiac muscle cells uh, to print uh, 3D cardiac tissues. Yes, it is feasible. Going off of that question, what are some future directions for using these cardiomyocyte cells? Like, should are there, um, you know, cardiovascular organoids that are being developed, or some other methods of 3D making 3D tissue structures out of these cells? Yeah, so there are um, there are several directions, you know, for using the cells. I mean, this is the first time, you know, we have the ability to make these cells. The first direction would be. Um, especially in the um, big pharmaceutical companies. So they develop lots of you know, drugs, um, but only a few of them um, can finally you know, enter the market. So one of the big problem is for whatever drug, you need to consider the side effects, especially that drug has, you know, that drug could be uh, developed to treat a cancer, let's say, but then it has uh, toxicity effects on human heart then that, that drug will be dead, okay? But then how do you test that? You know, you don't want to wait until you uh, finish clinical phase one and phase two, and then you see, you see that side effects on the human heart. You already spend like $500 million. You definitely don't want to do that. So what they want to do now is they want to use human cardiac muscle cells or 3D uh, cardiac tissues and then they want to test the drug toxicity using these human cells. So previously they used the mouse cells because they just cannot have human cardiac cells. Um, but the mouse cell, you know, even that drug show no toxicity for mouse cardiac cell that may still have toxicity for human cell, right? Because, you know, mouse cardiac cell is different from human cardiac cell. So now many of the big pharmaceutical companies, they really want to have human cardiac muscle cells or 
3D human contact tissues for drug toxicity testing. So I think definitely that's one of the approach. And the other uh, big direction would be use these cells for clinical trials as a cell therapy. And um, it's been, um, I know there are um, some labs in Japan, they already did it for uh, using these cells to treat real uh, human heart patients. So they already did, did this experiment for three to five patients. So it's already been going on. So, but it, we haven't tried, you know, the large scale uh, clinical phase three trial using these cells. So, so far looks pretty promising. So I like both of the directions, you know, one is for directly for therapy, one is for drug testing. Both of them are pretty promising of using these cells. Yeah, definitely. It doesn't seem like there's any more questions. Should we just wrap it up here? Okay, yeah, good for me. Sure, sounds good. Hey, well, thank you again to everyone who is uh, who attended this talk, and thank you, Dr. Leon, for giving this presentation. Yeah, my pleasure.